about SREC trade. So we started in uh, 2007 as, as a way to have a market-based approach to these markets as opposed to this bilateral brokerage-based approach that was there before. So our, our uh, kind of our initial product was a many-to-many -many auction. Uh, these SRECs aren't actually created real-time. They're only created once a month or once a quarter on these registry systems. And so what we do is once a month or once a quarter, depending on the region, whether it's in the mid-Atlantic area or the Northeast, uh, we run an auction where everybody who wants to buy and sell participates in one auction and there's one clearing price. So we have several thousand sellers. Um, a few dozen buyers, they all enter their prices, uh, supply and demand curve match, and that's the clearing price, and that's what everyone who participates in that auction actually gets or pays for their SRECs. And so that's our, our main product that we started out with to try and bring some transparency to the market. Um, after we, we started doing that, we realized that it's very difficult to, to manage your SRECs. Uh, for those of you who've used GATS or uh, Nipool and actually gone into that system, you know that it's not the easiest thing to use. And uh, registering your systems is not the easiest thing to do either if you've worked with the states to do that. So we branched out in, uh, and do asset management, registering systems, tracking systems, doing meter readings, uh, all those uh, just kind of asset management tasks that uh, most installers and developers don't want to have to do. And uh, voice brokerage is always going to be there in this market. It's an inefficient market with a whole bunch of different uh, <clears throat> participants, a bunch of different products, especially for longer-term contracts. You're going to have to do bilateral voice brokered contracts, and, uh, and we facilitate those, especially for larger systems or for aggregates of, uh, of smaller systems. And uh, we also have uh, just recently started an aggregation service for parts uh, equipment as well. So for smaller installers, we act as, as one buyer for a whole bunch of small uh, installers so they can get better pricing. This is kind of our, uh, just a picture of what our uh, uh, asset management program looks like. So it's basically a friendly front door to, uh, to the GATS systems to see what you actually have created to enter your readings there. And then it also interfaces with what your pricing is that you've, you've received on your SREX, how many SREX you have not sold that you still have, uh, what your total uh, revenue has been on SREX. And so if you uh, manage a whole bunch of systems, you can go in and use these dashboards and these reports to see exactly where your portfolio stands. So market snapshot, I'm going to go real quick through uh, the individual markets, and then I'm going to focus on each individual one. The way that these graphs work is uh, you've got a picture of where the requirement is. So that's kind of the red line. That's the, uh, the number of SRECs that are required. You've got the uh, SRECs that are the uh, capacity that's actually in the states below that. And so if the, if the, uh, the colors are above the red line, it's an oversupplied market. If they're below the red line, it's undersupplied. A little caveat when you think about these is that a megawatt of electricity makes about 1,200 megawatt hours of electricity over a year, but it has to be operating for the whole year to do that. And so it's, it's a little confusing because we're mixing megawatts of capacity and megawatt hours, which is number of SRECs created in these graphs. And so you kind of have to think about it. If you needed uh, 1,200 SRECs in a year, you would have to have a megawatt installed in Jan on January 1st. Because systems are being installed all throughout the year, you really need about two megawatts installed uh, over the course of the year in order to get that, depending on what your installs are. There's some variability about when SRECs get created. There's obviously more created in the summer. There's more installation done in the summer. So there's a little bit of variability, just a caveat on that, but it gives you a good general feel for uh, where the markets sit. So just a, a brief overshot. You can see that uh, you know, in mass, we're, we're still undersupplied by, uh, by a good bit. In Pennsylvania, we're grossly oversupplied. In uh, New Jersey, we're a little bit oversupplied, and uh, and in Delaware, in D.C., we're a little bit closer to the line. Um, Maryland, closer to the line, although there's some issues with in and out of state there, and uh, and Ohio is uh, undersupplied in state and oversupplied out of state. So going state by state here. New Jersey is a uh, what we call closed market, so you have to have your system inside New Jersey to create a New, Jer New Jersey SREC. It's got the most aggressive standards, so it requires quite a few systems in, in place. And for many years, it's the most mature system as well. It's been in place for, for the longest amount of time. So for many years, the SREC prices were right at that alternate solar alternate compliance payment level, which was very high in the, uh, in the $600 range, high $600 range. So that attracted a whole lot of interest to New Jersey. And uh, you had a, uh, a bunch of systems come in, a bunch of larger systems come in. And so we very rapidly flipped from many years of undersupply to the first year of oversupply this year. And so we've seen uh, some pretty dramatic falls in, uh, in price there. The, the latest spot prices are in the $150 range from the $650 range for the previous energy year. And uh, we're seeing almost no volume transacted there. So it's 
the, the market is kind of frozen. Uh, most of the sellers who've been used to, to getting very high prices are saying, I'm not going to sell my Astrex for $150. And most of the buyers are saying, it's oversupplied. They're only worth a dollar. That's all I want to pay. And uh, so you're not getting a lot of matches in the market there. So we'll probably see a lot of action at the end of the energy year in the uh, July, August time frame there. Um, we've always had a problem in New Jersey with the uh, mismatch of the time frames of the sellers and the buyers, as, as the other speakers have, talk, uh, have spoken about. Most of the buyers in all of these markets are deregulated load serving entities. They don't know how many SREX they're going to need any more than three years from now. So if you ask them how much power they're going to sell in mass seven years from now, they have no idea. So they don't want to enter into a long term contract for SREX to cover a load that they don't know what it is. And that's a, an especially acute problem in New Jersey where most of the uh, the buyers, the natural buyers, have a three-year time frame. So if you want to get a long-term contract with the load-serving entity in New Jersey, it's probably going to be a three-year contract, and it's probably going to be a pretty significant haircut to now that $150 price. Um, in mass, we, uh, the, the other speakers have spoken a little bit about how it works, but you've got a 400 megawatt overall target. The really interesting thing to me, a lot of people in mass talk about the uh, soft floor price and, and say that's what makes it innovative. Um, maybe, maybe not. I'm not that interested in that. The really innovative part about the mass market is that the portfolio standard grows each year based on what happened the year before. And so most markets like New Jersey, for example, the number of SREX that are required grows by 2.5% per year, no matter what happened the last year. So if there was not much installation last year, it still grows 2.5%. If there's a whole bunch, it still grows 2.5%. The mass market's actually responsive, and if there was a huge build out the year before, the standard grows dramatically the next year. If there was no build out the year before, the standard might not actually, it could grow by zero the next year. Uh, it can't shrink, but it, it can go down to zero. So you have uh, a, a very dynamic system there that doesn't require legislative intervention like we're trying to do in New Jersey right now. And so um, mass is a much more stable market in the long term. Going back to New Jersey for just a second, legislatively in New Jersey, uh, because we have this oversupply, there's a glut of SREX, there's a lot of inertia in these uh, systems because you have uh, systems that have been planned for months, they've already secured financing, so even though it's ridiculous to build them, we're still building multi-megawatt New Jersey projects are still being built with $125, $150 spot SREC prices and even lower long-term SREC prices. And so you tend to really overshoot in those markets. And so in New Jersey, they're trying to pass legislation, which they've so far failed to do. Um, the, the governor is, uh, is cautiously for solar, but, uh, but not in a huge way. And so they're, they're really trying to work the legislation to make that uh, not have a veto. And uh, the BPU, which is the administrative side, the Utilities Commission is trying to administratively uh, kind of toy with the, uh, the system there as well. But they're limited in what they're allowed to do. And so if you have to do that every time you have an oversupply, it, it, it's really cumbersome and, and it might not work. Whereas Mass is the only state that has a system where you actually have, uh, it, it itself can react to the market without anybody else outside of the market taking an activist role. Um, there's a couple of issues in Mass that, uh, that make it challenging. It's quarterly SREC generation in, in Mass as opposed to monthly, and it, everything gets created a quarter in arrears. So it's a, basically a six month lag before anything, you see any revenue from your SRECs that you create. And uh, SREX the signals are, are very delayed because of that, the, the buy and sell signals. So as a market, that's a little bit of a challenge there. Um, it says uncertain SACP. That's actually changed. So they didn't have a fixed alternate compliance schedule. They do now have that in mass. And that $300 floor price that we talked about, not really bankable. So if you want to get project financing and you're saying that the, the, uh, it's actually a $285 floor when you count the commission, and you go to a bank and say, hey, I've got this guaranteed $285 floor price, they're going to say, no, we don't see that as a guaranteed revenue stream. So if you're looking at project finance and you want to get debt finance, that floor price doesn't really help you a lot. If you're building off your balance sheet, um, I or, or one of my uh, uh, colleagues here can probably convince you that you will eventually see the revenue at that level. It just might, might not come in the year that you want it to come. It might come two years later or three years later. Connecticut, I'm not going to talk much about. It's a, uh, they have a, a rec program, but it's being administered by a combination of a, a state agency and by the, uh, the regulated dis distribution portion of the utilities. And it will most probably just be an RFP style program rather than an actual market-based uh, trading program. And so there, there probably won't be a lot for us there as developers. If you can get on, in on the RFP, these RFP states are great if you get the RFP. And if you don't get the RFP, you're just out of luck. Uh, Delaware, we actually just won the, uh, the contract to, to run what's kind of an uh, innovative program there uh, where they will do yearly RFPs to 
provide the power for Delmarva, which creates most of the, uh, the load in Delaware. And uh, it's a, a tiered system depending on the size of your system. So if you're doing residential, you get a fixed price, which is, uh, which is pretty high right now. And if you're in a larger system, you actually do a competitive bid to determine what pricing you'll get. Uh, it does suffer from the same issue with the RFP that if you don't win, then uh, you're out of luck. The good thing is that they'll do the solicitation every year for the increase in load that year. And so uh, if you didn't get it this year, you can try again next year. And so that, uh, that program is, uh, is kind of unique in, in the states, and that will be kicking off your uh, Pennsylvania is a uh, case study in what happens when you have an oversupply. Pennsylvania is a state that allowed SREX to be created from systems in all of the states in PJM, which is pretty much all the mid-Atlantic states. And so places like Virginia that don't even have a portfolio standard, if you had a system there, you could sell into Pennsylvania. Uh, if you were in Delaware or Maryland, you could sell into Pennsylvania. And so that created a lot of supply for the Pennsylvania market. Uh, Pennsylvania also had a rebate program that was, was uh, pretty good that made it very lucrative to build systems in Pennsylvania, even as SREC prices continued to go down. And we also had the, uh, the tax grant in lieu of the tax credit for the 30% ITC, which was kind of unexpected when they developed these, these programs and made, made uh, solar even more lucrative. And so we had a huge oversupply in Pennsylvania. So you can see right now, and uh, I mean, we've got almost three times as much solar as we need in Pennsylvania right now, and it won't catch up for years uh, to, to the current supply, even if nothing else gets built in Pennsylvania. There's a law that's currently uh, being pushed in the state to try and accelerate the RPS. Pretty much all of these changes in law, the, the, uh, the general political feeling now is that no one wants to increase or create new mandates, but people are maybe hesitantly willing to accept accelerating existing mandates. So basically what they're doing is saying, I know you said that we needed to have this many megawatts in 2015. Let's just accelerate that 2015 standard to today, and then we'll, we'll reduce the slope, and we'll still have the same end goal at the end of the, the, end of the period. And maybe to, to sweeten the pot, we'll lower that SACP because the price of solar came down a lot faster than we thought it would. So the maximum ratepayer advocate, it's okay. The maximum you're going to have to pay now is less than you thought it was going to be before. So that's the tactic that everyone's trying on the legislative front with uh, no success so far except for in D.C. And D.C. actually closed their market to outside systems uh, in a rather disruptive way, but they did close it to outside systems uh, retroactively even for systems that were already in the state and then uh, increased at the same time, increased the standard. And so the, the D.C. market went from being, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, undersupplied uh, or oversupplied to under. Ohio has an interesting market because it's bifurcated, so some of the SRECs can come from a, any state adjacent to Ohio, and the rest of the SRECs have to come from inside of Ohio. Uh, the uh, Ohio market's also dominated by a, a couple of large utilities that source their own SRECs for their standard offer service load. And so one of those utilities has opted to build their own systems, and they uh, AEP is building several large systems, and so there's some... Uh, debate or, or question as to whether the state will be oversupplied for the in-state SREX. It's been undersupplied up until now. The out-of-state SREX are, are grossly oversupplied because all those Pennsylvania SREX aren't being sold in Pennsylvania. And the only other place if you're in Pennsylvania to sell your SREX is out-of-state Ohio. And so those are trading just slightly higher than a Pennsylvania SREX right now, down in the $30, $40 range, whereas Pennsylvania SREX are selling in the $10 or $20 range if you can sell them at all. Most of the buyers in Pennsylvania have SREX have a three-year life, and they've bought their SREX for already for the next three years. Uh, Maryland, North Carolina, and D.C. will kind of throw those all together. Maryland used to allow SREX from out of state, and so it was, it was uh, slightly oversupplied because of that. But just uh, starting January 1st of this year, it closed its borders to out of state SREX, and so now it's, it's flipped over to undersupplied. But that's a market that's kind of right on the edge. So if a whole bunch of developers move in and build systems in Maryland, it'll go back to oversupplied again, and, and prices will go down. Because of that, the prices are, are pretty soft there. Also a small market. North Carolina allows um, a quarter of the, of the SREX to come from anywhere in the U.S., and so those SREX are, as you would imagine, worth nothing. And uh, the SREX from in-state, the one kind of key thing with SREX markets is in, in deregulated markets, markets work well. When the, when the electricity market is deregulated, it's actually a market when it's a regulated state where the electricity markets are regulated. There really is no SREC market there. And so this is the one place where the, everything is right for an SREC market except that it's a regulated state, and so we've seen no SREC market develop. So the regulated utilities go to their regulator and say, we're going to offer everybody $50 in SREC. How's that sound? And the regulator says, okay. And so they say, $50 in SREC. 
and take it or leave it. And if you leave it and they don't have enough at the end of the year, they just go back to the regulator and say, we offered everybody what you said we could and nobody took us up on it, so uh, we're not at fault, right? And they say, you're not, okay. They go forward. So there's really no market there. That, that's kind of how, how it's worked in North Carolina. Uh, Washington, D.C., as I said, they recently closed the market, and so th that pricing is significantly firmed up. That's kind of a success story as to how you can intervene with a, an SREC program that's been grossly oversupplied. So at, at one point, D.C. allowed SRECs from anywhere in uh, PJM and outside, and, and they closed it off, and so the prices uh, dramatically went up there, and, and that market will probably actually remain undersupplied for, uh, for many years because there's just a physical limitation to how much solar you can build inside the district. So already talked about some of the pitfalls of, uh, of SREC markets. Some states don't have a carve out at all. So there's, you know, California, there's nothing happening with SRECs because the regular rec price is just too low. Uh, places like North Carolina that have a regulated market and limited buyers uh, just doesn't work. SACP is pretty low in some places. So New Hampshire has a solar carve out. We don't run a market there. No one really does. Uh, first of all, it's a very small market. And second of all, the, the alternate compliance payment is so low that it's just really not worth uh, running a market and, and the market maker is only getting a few cents on each transaction and, and the seller is just getting a few dollars. Uh, places like Pennsylvania try to do rebates and SRECs at the same time. Bad idea. You, you drive uh, more capacity into an already oversupplied market. Timing of SREC cash flows is a big deal in mass. And uh, SREC compliance timing is kind of an issue too, which is this graph on the bottom shows. So as a seller, you want to sell your SRECs every month as they get created and get your money for the SRECs. The buyers only have to show that they've met their standard at the end of the year, and they have this true-up period for three months at the end of the year. So if you're a buyer, you would much rather wait until the end of the year and buy all of your SRECs in that three-month true-up period rather than buying them monthly throughout the year because you can use that money for something else, put it in the bank, whatever. And so we see in all the markets a, uh, a much lower volume than one-twelfth of the volume every month until the last month and then the, the three-month true-up period, and the volume is much higher then. And mostly that comes from the buy side. The buy side is just not interested in buying, especially in a state like New Jersey that they see as oversupplied at this point. They're saying, you know, why, why should we buy now? The prices are only going to go lower. And so there's been uh, very little volume in New Jersey, even though we're more than halfway through the energy year, probably only 20% of the required SRX have actually been, been purchased there. So that's, uh, that's what I've got. And again, I'll be ready to answer questions with everyone else.